So we will we'll start. Um, let's let's start with Michelle. She's first on the list. Wow. Good morning. Oh my God, April. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. No, it's perfect. Love. Love me. It's but perfectly toasty. Yeah, look, his jacket is off. Yeah, I may take it off. It is warm. It's it's a sauna. We're having a sauna experience here. Sauna. Can you throw some water on the rocks? Huh? Uh, yeah, it's just we just need to turn the heat down. We'll be fine. Okay. Shall I begin? Yes. Oh, just go. Okay. Great. Uh, good morning, I'm Michelle Fay. I'm Executive Director of Voices for Vermont's Children. And um, I think two of the senators are aware of Voices, but for your benefit, uh, Senator Susie, we uh, promote- Have you two met? We just introduced You're ourselves. So yeah. Uh, so Voices for Vermont's Children promotes public policy that enhances the lives of children and youth, and we are particularly interested in um, improving equity in our economy and in our institutions. And for us, attacking equity means directing resources and targeting policies to eliminate disparities. So as you heard last night during the public hearing, too many Vermonters are thrown into financial distress or forced to make unthinkable choices when they grow their families or experience a serious illness. Access to paid family and medical leave is an equity issue for low-wage workers, for women, and obviously for their children. So the U.S. Department of Labor has run extensive studies on leave-taking behavior in connection with FMLA, which has been around for 25 years now, and their data are clear. There are stark disparities in access to paid leave. Almost two-thirds of people earning more than the median income receive full pay during their leaves, compared to only about a third of those who receive less, who are, who are earning less than median income. And then for those folks who have, uh, who express uh, a need that would qualify for FMLA but are unable to actually take that leave, uh, it's substantially higher for people with children, people of color, and people with low incomes. The recent feasibility study on paid leave in Vermont projected that workers and families with incomes near the poverty threshold would increase their number of paid leaves by 38% compared with 9% for higher income families. And roughly a third of Vermont children live in low-income households. That's defined as at or below 200% poverty level. So you heard the testimonies of people who made it work when they experienced a serious illness or welcomed a new child without the benefit of paid family medical leave. Backed into a corner with no good choices, they were forced to take steps that undermined their family's financial security. 2012 FMLA survey data backs up their experiences. Leave takers without access, access to paid leave overwhelmingly reported that making ends meet was difficult. Most limit spending to their bare necessities, and many draw on their savings. More than a third put off paying bills, and about 30% borrow money. 15% sign up for public assistance. Even those families who are technically able to arrange paid leave by using their accrued sick or vacation time are left with no cushion for routine preventive health care appointments or unexpected events like child care closures or school snow days or even just a regular old sick day. Family economic security is fundamental. Uh, welcoming a new child to the family, recovering from a serious illness or injury, or supporting the recovery of a loved one are watershed moments that can set families on a path toward a healthy, secure future or turn them toward damaging hardship. The impact of spending childhood in poverty, impacts of spending childhood in poverty are devastating both to children and to our communities. Children raised in poverty experience poor health outcomes in relation to their non-poor peers. They're twice as likely to repeat a grade or be expelled, and more than twice as likely to drop out of high school. Girls raised in poverty are more than three times as likely to have a child as a teen. According to the Vermont Feasibility Study, an estimated roughly 1,100 to 3,200 workers and their families will stay above the poverty level due to benefits. Supporting family formation matters. When parents have access to paid leave to welcome a new family into a new child into their family, infants are more likely to be breastfed. I think you heard about that last night. They're more likely to have their full vaccination schedule, and they're more likely to have at regular checkups. Adoptive families experiencing a time of change and transition are allowed much needed bonding and relationship, relationship building time. 
And this is an interesting one. Partners' early shared involvement in the care of children is linked to reduced divorce rates, as well as improved cognitive development and educational performance for their children. So we all benefit. Supporting parents in their dual roles as employees and caregivers yields economic benefits as well. Evidence from states with FMLI show that these programs improve workforce attachment and support economic independence, with the greatest effects seen among the most disadvantaged families. Other key economic and health benefits include that children recover more quickly from illness when they're cared, by their, cared for by their, fam, uh, by their parents. Um, according to the Impact Feasibility Report, Vermont would experience savings due to an increased number of Vermont's newborn infants that are healthy and have normal birth weights. And there's some data. I did submit my testimony, but anyway, I think I submitted it at like 10.30 last night, so it may not be up on your website yet. Um, that includes 5% uh, fewer low birth weight babies, 8% fewer preterm births, and 10% fewer uh, infant deaths, child deaths. Vermont's foster care community needs our support. I was really glad there were a couple of folks testifying about yeah, that they last were, night. It was, yeah, it's a whole different you know, aspect about it. that one we hadn't necessarily thought about. Yeah. Those for, I, we um, work fairly closely with VFAFA, and we've heard from a number of members that those first two weeks when you have a foster care placement, you are running the child or children to, you know, catching up from a doctor's appointments they haven't had access to, you're taking them to the dentist, you're taking them to para, parent visits. There's just a lot of effort, especially in those first two to four weeks. Michelle, can you go just back to those figures, the percentages right before there about yeah. low aid and, and child deaths? And yeah. What, was that, what were those numbers related to? Um, access to paid leave is correlated with those better outcomes for babies. According to? Uh, uh, well, I can get the citation for that, but it, I think this actually came out of the impact report, the feasibility uh, study. The, the, the feds on FMLI. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Would you so get your testimony? 10%, sure. I did last okay. year. 10%. Ten percent fewer child deaths, five percent fewer low birth weight babies, and eight percent fewer As preterm a result births. Of having the access. State or any access to paid leave. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're, you know, I think we heard about people who are working up to the day their children were born. If you were mm -hmm. advised to have bed rest or you were advised to do something a little different, if you don't have access to paid leave, you're not able to do that. Is that essentially, in the flip of that, is that there would be 10% more deaths if you don't have paid leave? Is that a same, same, same thing? Uh, I suppose so. I think I think we're talking about the norm, like what's happening now. We can improve on that by providing access to paid leave. So it's not like doing nothing keeps things the way they are. If you act, give people access to paid leave, you can improve those numbers. Can you get us a little bit more information on those numbers? Sure. Okay. Um, okay, I'm really coming to the end here. Vermont needs okay. families to. Okay. <laughs> to build and sustain our economy, and those families need policies that make it possible to balance their roles as caregivers with their contributions to the workforce. The Vermont Department of Labor's forecast through 2024 lists sales, food prep and food service, and office administrative support positions as the job se sector is expected to have the greatest amount of growth. These are the very jobs that generally do not pay fam offer paid family medical leave. They offer wages below a livable standard and are typically held by women. So if this is the reality of our economy, it's incumbent on the state to invest in infrastructure to meet the needs of this workforce. And while establishing a family and medical leave program will have the greatest impact on low-wage employees in Vermont's service industry, it's a benefit that will attract and retain a vibrant and healthy workforce across all sectors. So our specific policy recommendations will sound very familiar. Uh, we strongly support uh, increasing the maximum leave back to 12 weeks as it was in the original bill. I think you heard a lot of evidence uh, about why that's important last night, but it is the minimum recommended leave for recovery and bonding with a newborn, newborn according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. And in addition to the health benefits of supporting those 12 weeks of bonding, there is an infant care crisis in the state of Vermont um, in our early care and learning system. Paid leave is infant care and will take some of the pressure off this system. Implementation of FMLI program would save Vermont families, and this is from, again, from the impact study, um, an estimated average of between $1,000 and $1,700 or $1,800, pri primarily from reverted childcare costs. And when you aggregate this across the state, it's between two and three and a half million dollars that would be saved by families. Um, the second recommendation is to make the benefit accessible to low-wage workers by maintaining or even increasing the uh, high-wage level replacement between 80 and 100% wage replacement 
think what we've seen from this, the early adopter states um, who, for whatever reason, started their wage replacements at 55 or 60 percent is that lower wage workers just weren't able to access that. So we can learn from their mistakes um, and make sure that that benefit is accessible right from the get-go. Um, we agree with uh, re reducing the eligibility threshold back to the original level so that people who are working seasonal or intermittent jobs who are paying into this program can access it when they need it. What was the original? Um, I think it was ooh, six out of 12. Is that six out of 12 months? For the original, yeah, for yeah. the eligibility, it was having more six out of the last six 12 months. Six out of 12 months, yeah. And then, um, and these are in no particular order. We all feel that we feel all four of these are very important. Um, but restoring the personal medical leave coverage is really critical. Um, as I think someone mentioned last night, the DOL shows that the majority of FMLA qualifying uh, leaves are for personal uh, illness or injury. So we need to design a program that works for as many Vermonters as possible. And that concludes my testimony. So I have a question on, you said that there would be, a, I think you said a 38% increase among low-income people in, in accessing mm -hmm. family leave if it was paid and a 9% increase. Yet the numbers we've seen so far so so very small increase with this bill mm -hmm. in terms of the projected costs and stuff. How, how, do, how do you square those numbers? I think I remember 6% is what they're projecting in terms of the increase in the number of leaves as a result of, I don't know if it's this bill or it's the House pass bill or it's the original bill, mm. but, or it, but it's surprisingly low. So I think a lot of that is, I would attribute a lot of that to, and I don't know if there's been any kind of pulling out of what I'm about to say from the, from the feasibility study, but as we heard last night, and as if you look at what other states have experienced, um, families are making it work. But when we talk, when we dig down and see how they're making it work, they're using up all of their accrued time. So at the end of their, for example, if it's, a, if it's an infant leave, a bonding leave, at the end of that leave, they have no paid time left to take their child to this next well baby visit, or if they themselves get sick, they they are just bottoming bottoming out all their leave. Um, or they're taking the leave and going into debt. They're putting everything on credit cards. I mean, so we heard all those all those stories last night, right? Yeah. So I think it's a question of creating a system that supports families and doesn't um, require them to make these terrible choices that then actually impact their financial security for the for the for years. See, I mean, it can take a very long time, I think, to dig out from those debts, and that impacts their children's well-being well beyond. I, I think you're probably right, but. Maybe it's the way we're describing it. it. You say there's going to be a 38% increase among more people who are taking the leave. It sounds like you may be saying, well, I'm not, I'm yeah. not sure. It's, it sounds like you're saying that they're not taking the leave now. They're not making it work and scraping everything to make it work. They're just not taking the leave. They're going to work. Yeah. So now there'll be a 38% of people who wouldn't go to work for six weeks or 12 weeks. And yet the, the the people who did the work up here, uh, the projections show very small number of people who take the other leave. I think I know what you're getting at now. So so the I'm I spent a fair amount of time with the 2012 um, DOL figures and the number of people, the percentage of people who don't take leave when they have a qualifying or an eligible reason to take a leave is very small. So it's about I think it's about five percent. So that's 38% of that 5%, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, of the people who are not taking leave, um, there, there's a disproportionate uh, representation of low-income people in that 5%, and so. So it's 38% of 5%. Right, the almost half nationally. I understand yeah, that, yeah. I guess I'm surprised that so few people are not taking I want to say this the correct way, that, yeah, so few people are not taking leave. If you listen to that testimony last night, it sounds like uh, um, most of the people are somehow continuing to work. Yeah. So, 
So right, it seems but like that, that supports it. That they're not taking the leave. They're continuing to work when they shouldn't be, and they're continuing to work while they're sick. Yeah. And on chemotherapy and in radiation. I mean, that woman who quit no holiday for two years you know, as a result. So yeah. And so deep debt. That's what. That's the impression I get. They're yeah. continuing to work. Yeah. And they're struggling. Okay. So if most people are doing that, and then you give them pay, then you would expect the amount of people who take leave to go up more than five percent. Would you? Yes, but I think what Michelle's saying is that of the 5% that are working through the hell they're going through, 38% of that 5% are the crowd that are more like, that, will, that she, they're predicting will actually well, take advantage. We may drill down more, I, I think maybe our, our staff is familiar with that, those projections. But it's just this, the way I read it is that there's 50,000 people taking the lead and that there's going to be 50 or whatever the number was, it's going to be a small number increase after the law. Uh, yeah, I think that the um, there's two different dimensions. There's a dimension we're talking about, but the people who are working through it somehow, you know, going to their chemo sessions and then going back to work, and then there's this other larger group of people who are somehow making it work, but not in ways that are actually good for their financial security. Yeah. And I think just a closing, I mean, our, I started out talking about equity because sometimes figuring out solutions that are equitable means really looking at those handful of thousands of people who are not being served by our system very well and figuring out how to make it work for them. Well, and what impressed me about last night is the people who are quote unquote making it work yeah. are having, it's not making it work, but it's digging themselves deeper into debt. It's, it's making life impossible financially and add so much stress that the stress is on the fabric of their marriages and their families and on everything else are just it's huge so it comes out elsewhere and that all doesn't benefit employers it doesn't benefit anybody schools children yeah. children anybody yeah. you'll see when you see my written testimony I've put made it work in quotes because it's clearly not Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go a little bit out of order here because I want to save the department for to be our end witnesses. So can we hear from Erin right now? Kara. Erin. 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 She may be in the hall. She just testifying somewhere else. Okay, so how about Ray Buffard? Is she here? Oh. Okay. Sorry. Can you mother come for now? Oh. Well, if you're looking for Eric, if you can find her, that would be great. Maybe right next door because I have to take a picture of Ag right now, and I think she may be in there. Let me take a five-minute break. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I'm chair of the Economic Development Committee at the Legislature, and uh, we welcome you. We have a, a room full of people here, and uh, two other senators, uh, Senator Clarkson from Windsor County and Senator Susi from Rutland County, I'm from Chittenden County, and I understand you wanted to testify on H-196, paid family leave? Yes. And we welcome your testimony, so go for it. Well, uh, first of all, thanks very much for, for calling and, and uh, entertaining uh, you know, my, my conversation with you guys. Uh, just quick brief, uh, I'm a Vermont native, uh, own a small grocery store in Georgia, Vermont, about 10,000 square feet. Uh, been here since 2005. I come from a corporate background where I was with banking for a number of years, 46 years, and we went uh, bankrupt as a company. Can everybody hear me? Because sometimes phones are crazy. Everybody can hear me? Yep, no, yes. you're coming through good. Oh, yes. Okay, perfect. So, so here's the concern I have. Uh, over 50% of my staff is under the age of 18. Um, and when you're under the age of 18, there's certain things you can't use. You can't use knives and slices and grinders and all these things, nor can you be bonded. And I have four departments in my grocery store. We're a full service grocery store. So we have a produce department, a bakery department, a post office, and a meat department. 
which are highly specialized departments as far as I'm concerned. And they're not like they're not like uh, you know a cashing cashing position, which is you know or, or you know somebody who's on the floor of working groceries. Those are more entry level positions. I mean, they're in the produce department, bakery, post office, or meat department. They're highly specialized, uh, and these are all full time people for me that I give them between two and three weeks of vacation now, depending on how long they've been with me. Um, and we struggle to cover the week when they're gone. We, we're able to forward plan. When, when, when my meat man is gone for the week, we're able to forward plan because they do orders, they work on ads, they do pricing uh, because the market's so volatile. We're able to forward plan the week. Uh, and I usually fill in the gap. I'm, I'm the owner and I'm the guy who fills in the gap because, because it requires somebody trained. And for, for, you know, in this case, uh, to train somebody in the department or train somebody in the post office or train, train somebody for, you know, produce or for bakery requires anywhere from maybe 30 to 50 hours of quick training time. So, again, when you, when you leave them, you know, when they're done for a week, when they take a week's vacation, you can plan around that, make adjustments, and survive, and knowing that they're back in the eighth day. So this, this paid leave of six weeks poses for us a major challenge that, a couple of options, you know, may may occur as this is happening for us. Is that we, you know, if, if somebody opts to apply and get get the, you know, the, the you know, the, the the state to allow them to take this pay leave, and if somebody else from another department at the same time has an issue and and applies the same thing and gets and gets accepted, it puts the, the owner, it puts the business at a high risk because we don't have staff to roll into those departments to cover that six week span. In the case of the, you know, in this, in this case where I fill in, there's only so many. For me to have to go in and try to cover six weeks in the, in the produce department and six weeks in the meat department, we would never be able to do it. So my option would be then, I have to go hire somebody and train somebody. So then at the end of six weeks when that person comes back, I've got an extra person that I can't use. I can't maintain on my staff. And that's, that's the dilemma that I see with this thing because it requires a way to fill the void and we don't have physical bodies to slide into that position because again, these are not entry level positions. Uh, these, you know, a, a meat cutter, a meat cutter really has two years of meat cutting under his belt before he's able to do a meat cutting thing. He has to go through basically a whole, a whole process that, you know, to, to gain the ability to cut meat. Uh, and that's, that's the problem we have, and then, and then, you know, you know what happens to us is we end up, you know, having to hire somebody, train them prior to, which has added cost to us. We're a small business. We're a very, very small. How, we're not. Small? We're not a chain. You know, we're. How, we're how, small. how small are you? I'm sorry. How small are you? How many employees we're, do you have? We have 38, okay. but over half of those are 18, and they're high school kids. Come in at four o'clock and rent register, you know, from four, you know, fill the beer from four o'clock till, till eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the summer time. How many hours do they work? This is Senator D'Souza, right? How many hours do they work? More than 30 hours a week? The no, both of these are, most of these are 12, most of these are 12, eight, people. How many full time I mean, there's, employees there's, do you have? We have, I have six full timers. Six okay. full timers. They're, they're 40 hours. They're 40 hours a week people. So you have 38 people. Um, just, I just have a question for our staff here. Would they be covered under existing law right now if you had six full time and 30 part time? Uh, the the existing law um, goes off of average of 30 hours per week. And so it's really a question of are there, in addition to those six 40 hour a week workers, do they have an additional four to nine workers who are averaging 30 hours or more per week? Um, and so that, that's the question about whether they're covered by the unpaid leave law now. So, uh, Ray, this is Damian Leonard from the Office of Legislative Counsel. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have additional workers in the, the that average 30 hours or more per week, or is it just those six 40 hour work a week workers? That's, that's what I have currently. With, with college, it's out. I have a couple students that come back and they work 
30 plus hours, but that's just from, from you know, really take environment June through, you know, August, uh, sometimes early, early part of September. So there's just a couple of college kids, but, but that's pretty much it. My six full timers, and again, you know, the, pro the problem we have is that most of, again, most of my, my staffing part time students, uh, the parents get involved and say, I don't want little Johnny working more, he's got more than eight per week. You know, you know, school is more important. That's, that's our emphasis too. Um, so it requires more bodies. And we, we, you know, we're open, we're open from seven to eight, seven days a week. So we have to fill the void. We have to, you know, we have to have staffing here. But it takes multiple people to do it because some will need to work eight hours a week. So I've got a couple of my students only work one shift, one four hour shift a week. So Ray, it's, it sounds to me like you're probably not covered by state and federal law right now in guaranteeing a person who wanted to take leave, if they could afford to take it, you wouldn't have to give them that person's job back. And uh, so in that situation, uh, uh, it's, it, in that situation, you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to give job protection, and this law wouldn't change that in any way. If somebody wanted to take the leave and you were hard pressed, you would you could hire somebody else and not have to train them train that you wouldn't have to then fire that person who you trained. You can keep that person on, and you could lay off uh, the person who took the leave. Um, yeah, but that but that. That's not a win situation for us because I'm taking somebody who has got years of experience and letting them go for somebody who's just come in, uh, you know, and has you know six weeks of weeks of experience under their belt because they worked with the right. I understand. That, that, but, that's but, not fair. But, that's not but, fair. Uh, right. But, uh, but unfortunately, what you're saying is what you're saying is that you want to if somebody wants to take the leave now, you're banking on the fact that that person can't afford to take the leave to help your business, and you don't want to see that person get any money in order to take the leave. What, what I don't want to have happen is me jeopardize my business, uh, my sales, my customer loyalty, because I can't get rid of the person who came and developed the void for that six weeks. That's what I don't want to happen, because people develop relationships. People who have a, we have a real, a real old-fashioned budget here. Where you come to mind me, guys, say, hey, you know, hey, Jason, I don't know, this week I have company coming, I need to realize an inch and a half thick. You can't get that. You can't get that kind of service at a Jennifer Shaw's price chopper because they do what they do. But you can do that in my shop. So people come in to me. I just took an order two minutes ago for somebody who needs at least five me to make beef, beef jerky. You can't get that at the Hannaford. You can't go to Hannaford and say, I need six pounds of jerky meat. They just they won't do it. So I, I would jeopardize I would jeopardize my business if I was to let my you know my meat my meat guys have been really for, for for seven years let him go at the end of six weeks because because I can't can't absorb the guys who filled in for him that's suicidal for us. Right, right. Do you have you? This is Allison. Um, have you had in the past uh, workers who have either had a a, a parent die or. You know, go through the death of of, of somebody in their family, or um, or a ca cancer, something where they've had to take some time off. How have you managed when? Because you, it sounds like you have a good relationship with your employees. How have you managed uh, those needs? They've never left me for six weeks. What What's the most time people have left you for? So when there's a death in the family, they they, they might go for three four days. Um, you know, I I. I understand that probably as well. If anything, I'm going through an autoimmune disorder right now called CIPP. I know what it's all about to be in the hospital for four weeks. Right. I was there. I was there. I was just there. Okay. Right. So, so, but, but the long story short of this thing is that, is that, you know, yes, it's fine in the end to try to do the best you can. We have a business to run and we have a responsibility to, uh, I have a responsibility to my employees, to, to my community and to my family to keep us in business. And independent markets like myself are fastly disappearing. And if, you know, I just had I just had the Girl Scouts here this past weekend. They sold 270 some odd like, cases of cookies out of my store. When stores like me disappear because we can't afford to maintain and to stay in business because of these types of things that, that keep coming at us, 
When we disappear, try to go to Dollar General and try to sell cookies there. No. Try to go to the neighborhoods and try to set up these programs. I'm the largest supporter for our local little league here. I believe for a thousand dollars a year, to, I supply all their jerseys. Right. Go, and, to, and, go and, to Dollar General and try to get a thousand dollars out of them. And, and Ray, we we actually all appreciate that and are very and are are very grateful for those businesses. I'm just curious, how did the store manage while you were gone for those that time while you were dealing with your disease? I was very lucky that my wife, you know, ran the store for me, for us. You know, she became, she, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed that I have a wife who has a great knowledge of this business. And the beauty of technology for me is that I can still do stuff from my hospital bed. You know, technology is a wonderful thing, good and bad at the same time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, but, but, but for somebody to leave me for six weeks because, and I don't understand fully how, how, how the constraints will be placed on people, but it's my understanding that they can't take this time for themselves but they can take this time for family members. So, you know, do we get a chance to weigh in on this, or do we have any say in this whatsoever? Because, you know, if, if you know, if the doctors, I know, I know doctors firsthand are very convenient with what they with the, what they tell you because they try to cover themselves pretty tightly. They don't want to run any risks themselves of saying you're ready or you're not ready. They are very, very, very conservative. I know that firsthand. Well. We're, 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 when you ask how are we getting feedback, you're giving us feedback right now. So and we've and we've heard we had a public hearing last night where people gave us uh, plenty of feedback. Were you on the verge of saying that you thought the bill at the moment needed to have um, personal medical leave added to it if we were going to go ahead with it? No, no, no. I, 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 it's my understanding you do not have personal medical leave. We don't. I was just curious if you thought if. In an ideal world, we could figure out how to replace your workers if we should add personal care back in, personal medical care back in. Well, you know, here's again the problem we have. I am a small business without a wealth of people to slide into positions. We're not in here for where I could, where I could pull somebody from another store, from another part of the chain to fill a void. I got no way. I got no way. So, so you know, that's the problem we have. And again, I, I don't have the ability to, to, to sever somebody who's coming to fill the void, then, then that's where the problem is, because I can't absorb it. I can't, not, a, not a state of business. You know, you know, if, 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 if the intention is to, you know, to drive small business out, this is certainly going to be a part of that. You know, we're, we're getting fire bombarded every day with stuff. Uh, you know, local, state, federal level, it's unbelievable. Like, I've been doing this for a long, long time, and I've never seen the flurry of activity that we're seeing now. Never seen it. Okay. Well, uh, I want to thank you for your testimony. I, you know, I just end by saying I know it's not any great solace to you, but uh, we don't, we, we have a significant effective small business exemption in this bill at this point, and that in some cases works to the detriment of the workers who work for small businesses versus large businesses. So it may not be perfect, but at least you have, you're exempt from the law of having to protect someone's job. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with it personally, but uh, that's where it is right now. And uh, at least you have that choice. Some employers don't even have that choice under the federal law. So. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time. We have a bunch of other witnesses we have to go through. I think we've heard you uh, very clearly. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time. Thank and good, good luck with your health. Thank you. I no, no didn't problem. realize you were moving around. Yeah, well, I would apologize. I was like three minutes late for that photo op. You were, but um, Linda took some. So, okay, go ahead. So what? Okay, go ahead. That makes me feel better. Um, so I will be, I'll be brief as well. Uh, for the record, Erin Segrist with Vermont Retail and Grocers Association. Thank you for taking the time uh, to hear from us. Um, just a quick overview, VRGA represents about 700 members across the state. As you are aware, I've been in here and shared with you in the past. Um, we're made up of small businesses that serve as stewards in the community. Across Vermont, we support local organizations, as you had just heard um, Ray talking about Girl Scout cookies. Um, we hire young adults with little to no experience and train them with the foundation of real world experience. Um, and quite often, they work right alongside employees seven days a week. 
Um, I do want to throw in there that uh, you know these are the, the small businesses really are um, again the stewards in the communities and they really do have fantastic relationships and they work one on one with their employees to ensure that their their needs are being met. Um, we have pulled members uh, regarding H196 and received feedback about the bill as well as the various benefits that they're offering um, to their employees, including extended paid time off, uh, short-term and long-term disability retirement plans, flexible work arrangements, and additional training to, to name a few of them. As entry-level employers, retailers, and grocers are the training ground for the workforce in this state and will be the most affected employers in the state should this bill move forward. Members have expressed a couple of concerns. First of all, fund sustainability. Um, there's a concern that estimates from joint fiscal are conservative and that more employees will apply and participate, leading, leading the fund to be unsustainable. Just a quick numbers crunch. Um, an employee making the average wage of $13 an hour would pay into the fund $38.13 a year. And if they're eligible for the full six weeks with pay at 80%, they would draw down just under $2,500. We have significant concern, again, that the fund is unsustainable. Um, number two, staffing concerns. As Ray was just talking, um, small businesses do have a concern about filling management or pertinent positions for those six weeks to ensure continuity and staffing and management of the business as well as customer service and managing employee workload. Quite often, six weeks, we'll take it on the chin, right? If, we, if someone is to leave for an extended amount of time, we manage workloads among other employees. That means that their responsibilities can differ and, and there is some um, disruption in the workplace. Finally, um, mandated benefits, you've heard this before. While small businesses in Vermont appreciate and continue, the, they appreciate the continued community support, we remind the committee that a state of 620 residents can only provide so much support. This is why we continue to have discussions surrounding the increasing disparity in wages, which we all have concern about. Small businesses are quite often working with individual employees to ensure that they have the benefits that are valuable to them. And each individual is different, as is each business. Their ability to offer various benefits at their discrepancy is an opportunity to attract employees. Mandating benefits eliminates the ability to be competitive and the ability to provide flexibility to employees, which they may request. Um, we ask that should the committee move forward with this bill, that it stand as is. We would not ask. Um, we would ask you to not include an employer mandated pay. Um, what am I saying here? The, right, a required a match. Or yes, a match. match. Thank you. Um, but to keep it voluntary. We would we would appreciate it um, if it were voluntary. Yes. So the difficulty I'm having is the following. It almost sounds like that the bill that came over um, has no <coughs> has no job protection for um, for people who work in small businesses. The corollary is it doesn't require you to hold open the job. You don't, it sounds to me like you don't want to facilitate in any way these people taking leave. So you would, like if I was injured, and let's say it applied to uh, to the individual I was injured, I had the wherewithal of my family to, to pay, to support me during that leave. You wouldn't want me taking that leave even if I could pay for it myself. I don't think that's at all the case. Well, um, all, this is, all this is doing is allowing people to pool their own resources to buy an insurance policy to get them through an illness or a family illness. But I, I assume you share Mr. Bufard's position. Bouchard. 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 Uh, Bouchard. position that that's not good for them that people can have the resources to take the lead. I think it's rather difficult for small businesses to uh, manage a business short-staffed. Um, 
I think that that's the, the concern that a number of small businesses share across the state. We're already at 0.3% growth in, in um, unemployment, which means that it's very difficult to find employees now. So if I have if I have an opening I because someone has left for six weeks, it's very hard to find somebody to cover that six weeks anyway. Right. So That's again, it impacts all of the employees because they're going to be stretched extra thin when they have to make up for a person's absence for six weeks. And, and that's why I think the federal government and the state and the House has left a very substantial small business exemption. If you can't deal with it, you move on if the person wants to take the leave. All they're trying to do is, is set up a fund to help pay for their daily living expenses while they're ill and can't draw down a paycheck. Until such time they go back to work or find another job afterwards. But somehow it sounds to me, I'm interpreting it as that the that that little step of social uh, having setting up a social insurance program to allow people to have some money during an illness or a family member's illness is essentially making it more likely that people will take the lead and we you don't know, like that. And I'm again sharing that there is concern about filling those positions for an extended period of time. Especially when we only have 620,000 people in the state and we only have so many people looking but for we're not position. saying, But we're not saying you don't have the choice that you always have to fill that position for six weeks. You could also go ahead and move on to find another employee. And I absolutely, I understand where you're coming from, but if we have a really good employee, our concern again is how do we fill that for six weeks? We don't, if we have a really good employee, we don't want to let them go. Okay. You know, we want to work with them. We're small businesses bend over backwards trying to work with the employees. I'm simply saying there is concern about how we're going to fill that. I understand where you're coming from, Senator. Yeah, and I, and we heard. Last, we heard. I understand answer. where you're coming from too. We heard last night about some union plans where they allow their members to buy uh, disability insurance, and uh, so if they work for a large firm now, they have a right to come back to work uh, after 12 weeks. And the problem in the interim from the leaving is because they don't have any money to replace the paycheck. So the, the temporary disability insurance that people can buy through their unions is helping them take that time off and then they come back. Um, I don't see this really as, especially when the employers are not contributing anything, I don't see this as more than a universal pooling of small amounts of money to allow an insurance policy out there to allow people to leave. Make this Absolutely, but again, I, I, I'll go back to the fund sustainability. If if an employee who makes thirteen dollars an hour is putting in thirty eight dollars and thirteen cents and drawing down just under twenty five hundred, there's there's significant concern that it's unsustainable, and we'll be right back here next year or the following year asking employers to match that, well, and employers who are already being. Um, it's already being discussed in this building about increasing minimum wage to fifteen dollars. We have mandated paid sick days. Well, you know, it's a cumulative impact, and and small businesses in this state, ninety percent or ninety six percent of the businesses in, the, in this state, are are getting stretched thin, and we have significant concern that if this fund is unsustainable, we are going to be stretched even further thin, and we have we have only so much elasticity before the band breaks. I, I, I don't necessarily, I mean, I think it's perfectly acceptable that you have concerns that the fund is unsustainable, but the fact that it only costs so much to, to get so much benefits is not the full end of the equation. You have to look at how many people are going to take the benefits. So, and how many people are contributing. Right, how many people are contributing. So those numbers may be right, but on its face, that doesn't necessarily say to me that it's unsustainable. Those two numbers. Um, I, I agree that we'll be back here if, if not a, a number, if we don't have a, a large number of people who take advantage of this opportunity. Because it is, it's a low, it's a low contribution 
for a big benefit. Um, I don't disagree with you. I, I, I think that it's predicated on the fiscal note is on, on however many number of people actually participating. So if that if we'd be back if that number of people were not participating, we need to figure out something else. Aaron, the. Uh the original house version, and then it was changed, uh, was from 15 employees down to 10. Or if it was back to 15 employees, would that give you guys any comfort, or does that not? I think the small business, um, the small businesses that we represent are right between the 15 and 20 employees. So, you know, I don't have the exact numbers on how that would impact my members. Um, you know, if you're interested in increasing the exemption. I, I, yeah, I'm just looking at that. And, you know, I certainly am concerned about small businesses and uh, how they operate, as you know, I, I run one of them. Uh, but I also am concerned about these people whose lives are devastated, who may not be able to work anyway, whether or not they're funded or not. Uh, you know, for example, if someone gets pregnant and there's, there's some issues, they're going to be out for an extended period of time. The employer is still going to have to figure out what to do with them. Uh, as far as, uh, there are some specialties, certainly, that uh, some small businesses are going to be hurt. There's no doubt that the meat cutter is one example. Uh, a guy who paints cars, for example, is, uh, is also, uh, you know, so the skilled worker is going to be difficult to be replaced. But in the same respect, you want people to be happy and to be good employees. Uh, so, Absolutely. Yeah. I completely agree with you. So, I, I think that um, small businesses, again, across the state, work very closely with their employees to, to make them happy. And um, nobody wants to be in an uncomfortable work environment, So, including the business owner. So I think that you're right. Yes, we all work together. Um, and again, I'm just reiterating the concerns that my employers are, are How facing. many employers did you talk to on this, and were there some who were in support of it? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have exact numbers. I would say probably about 40% of the membership responded to this, good, yeah. this poll. Um, yes, there are some who are supportive of it. Um, a majority of them are not supportive of, the, of it. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to, to get the percentage difference. Um, it was a much smaller percentage that, that we're in support of, of something like this. Because we heard, as you know, last night, I can't remember if you were there last night, but there were, we heard from a couple of small businesses that were very supportive of it and were. And, and uh, um, yes, I did attend for a short amount of time, um, but as you are all aware, uh, the public forums are usually quite one-sided um, and the majority of my businesses um, that I have had come in and testify at public hearings are quite often um, disenfranchised at the end of the night. Um, How so? Uh, for example, uh, the minimum wage testimony, uh, pu public hearing, there were three people against and several people for. Um, How is that disenfranchising though? That's so there were several comments made throughout the night. One said that if you don't pay $15 an, an hour, then you don't deserve to be in business. Um, there were several comments that were made throughout the night. One of my members from Burlington was actually um, harassed via email. You're kidding. Um, yes, and, and he's a very active person yeah. in the community, um, reported that that was the first time that they had made a profit. This past year was the first time they made a profit it was $30,000 and they gave it all back to the employees and they were still harassed via email. Well, okay, uh, harassment, never a good thing by email or otherwise. Um, but putting that aside, and, and I, I'm not the biggest supporter of public hearings because as you say, I do think uh, various sides tend to bring their people to be heard. With that said, um, you know, the business community, I think, deploys very uh, very tough rhetoric when they don't want something. They talk about businesses leaving the state. Uh, they talk about, they talk down the economy of Vermont as a way of not getting additional regulation. So I, I think it's, it's there on both sides. What I would say is 
I know the chair was looking last night to hear from the business community. What are your substantive concerns um, about this legislation? So last night was all, was entirely supportive of of the bill. It would have been great to have some of your people show up and and to be heard because I don't think they would have been harassed. I think again, the business community is rather disenfranchised. Um, but, but again, I'm, why would I want to bring my employee? My they're here businesses? in the building now. They're but here disenfranchisement. That, that's the word I'm quibbling with. That means you can't vote or you're not heard. The business community has the bulk of the lobbyists yeah. that, that we're seeing in the in the building. Okay. Where's disenfranchisement? I don't get that. Maybe I'm picking the wrong word. Okay. Um, the business community in this building refuses to make an effort because they don't need the harassment. What are, is there a is there a sustained well, harassment? Well, I I I agree that I don't think that businesses in the yeah. public forum that it's. Um, it's good for their business to testify uh, because they can be, I won't necessarily mm -hmm. say disenfranchised, but they can, uh, people can look upon them as uh, being evil or being bad because mm -hmm. they didn't support $15 or they don't support mm -hmm. paid family leave. So I think there can be some repercussions for businesses testifying in a, in a public uh, forum like that. Uh, in, in that, uh, you know, it is one-sided uh, and that said, I thought it was a, a great public hearing. I really enjoyed the stories that people said, and uh, you know, it was impactful oh, very on on how uh, you know illnesses and tragedies have impacted families. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you know, again, we have to be mindful of the impact that these have on businesses, and I do think that it is a cumulative effect. Uh, that uh, you know, you look at fifteen. I want people to make more money, and then you look at this, and then another, and all of a sudden now there's a lot of regulations that makes it even more difficult to do business in the state of Vermont. Yeah, and I, and I take that point. I, I was just the, the, the representation of business owners as disenfranchised and harassed doesn't square with reality as I'm seeing it in the building. Business owners, by and large, get, get the legislation that they want. Um, you know, but with with that said, um, I, I would know. respectfully uh, disagree to some level. Uh, but regardless, I, I think that um, you know the the ability for businesses to call in or to come in and, and have a conversation with the committee. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing that opportunity. Um, Again, I think that there is ample opportunity for the business community to participate in public forums in the future. However, um, it's going to take more than one person trying to bring their, their members to the hearing. Um, oh, yeah, I, I, know, I agree. I, but most public hearings, I mean, I've sat on so many different committees when we hear, have public hearings on tax or on, on firearm safety. We have so many pro and cons. It has been interesting in our two economic development public hearings that we've had this year that that really there it hasn't been an equitable number on both no, sides. It's very unusual. For frankly, you. I'll I'll share with you. It's because quite often the legislature continues to pit employees against employers. Employers and employees have fantastic relationships. We need to stop pitting them against each other right. and putting. Offering these public forums is fantastic, and I appreciate it. But there needs to be work on everyone's side to have it more balanced and have a, a balanced conversation. And when my businesses show up to a public hearing and basically say you don't deserve to be in business because you don't do this, this, or this, I'm not going to go out of my way to bring to, a, bring, to bring my members. I'd much Sorry, rather have that experience. Well, and and I'll say one more thing, then I'll shut up. I, I think the reason why, honestly, you don't use the public forums is because you have very powerful private forums, and and that's just the state of affairs. I I, I apologize that that's how you feel. Mm -hmm. I'm sharing how I feel. I I really sure. try to get my members to go to the public yeah. forum, and again, my members are concerned that they will have repercussions. They will face repercussions, and it's not fair. They're they're working as. Again, stewards in communities across the right. state, they, oh, they 
donate their time, their money. They, um, again, are the workforce training, trainers of, of the state. I think that we need to start giving biz small businesses, especially, the credit where credit is due. And it's, it's rather frustrating walking into this building every day, watching employees being pitted against employers. I don't, I don't see it that way. My, raising the minimum wage, to my mind, isn't pitting employees against employers. I personally believe that if we want to um, lift the state up, we should be working on workforce development and providing public and private um, opportunities where employees can get additional training so that they can move up the economic ladder. And you know, I mean, that's I a top priority. Senator, yes. Yes. I appreciate I believe that we can continue to do that instead of arbitrarily increasing the minimum wage. Aaron, um, you mentioned uh, the survey you did, and you're going to get us, you could get us the percentages, and you said that it mostly or very strongly against the bill. Is that the bill as introduced, or out of general, or as, as it is now? Um, good question. Thank you. That was for uh, the bill as introduced. We have not pulled them again uh, this year, but I'm happy to do so um, if time allows. I'm not sure when what your timeline is for, for moving this bill. Well, I'm not sure either, but it's probably unlikely unless you can do a quick turnaround because we're only going to be here for another month. So. Right. Uh, I will do my best. Because yeah, it's changed so yes. completely, it would yes. be interesting to. Uh, I'll get on that today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner. Yes. Um, would it be okay if I asked Dirk? We'll just, have, we'll just have you. Sure. Sure. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, I think this is the first time you've been here on this bill. Um, and I guess I'd like to start off, uh, I'd like to do a deep dive in terms of your concern, uh, but I'd like to start <coughs> off with, is there an administration position on the bill that passed the House? Sure. Um, so for the record, I'm Lindsay Curley, Commissioner of Labor, mm -hmm. and um, this will probably come as no surprise to you, the administration does not support the bill as the governor does not support any new taxes and fees. So um, with that, you know, I res we respect that you have a decision to make, and there's been some really compelling testimony, right? For so, sure. Uh, oh. Let, let her, oh, oh, okay. No, I'm just curious because this is a this is a voluntary contribution. It's, no, it's not voluntary. Well, you know, it's not it's so far from voluntary. Every employee <laughs> in the state has to contribute. So everybody can so, tell. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So no. Okay. I, I mean, I'm. Okay. That's okay. Um, so you know, we we but that had, looks like just yeah. Well, well, you know, <laughs> I can't even get a sentence no, start. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get a reputation here. But, sorry, so sorry. is the, the the problem the one the point one four tax on employees? Is that the governor's problem? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so um, that's that's part of the problem. The other part, which which is I'll go into addressing um, going forward, is just. The department's role, as you know, in the bill is to um, design the system and implement the system and administer the system. And we've looked over the bill and have concerns because, um, well, well, sort of, we were asked to do a cost estimate. That became a very difficult task because the system isn't designed yet. And so the only thing we could really um, lean on to come up with an estimate was our current UI unemployment insurance tax and benefit system. Um, for those, I think you all know this, but this is a federal program. All of our employees that work in the UI um, section are all paid by federal funds. Um, but it was sort of like something we could look at. It's an insurance program. So when we started looking at it and looking at the estimate that was provided to us, and I can't remember, Joyce might be able to jump in, who created that estimate to begin with? Is it okay if Joyce weighs in on that? Well, are you talking about the, the estimate on administrative costs? Yes, as well as like the implementation, like IT building right. and implementation and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, so Joyce, we look, if, if yeah. you wanted to lean yeah. on Joyce, who yeah. provided that initially? Sure, that's the feasibility study that was done for the Vermont Commission on Women in 2016. Thank you. Okay. So um, there were, you know, as we look down through the list of, um, employees that they suggested we would need to have, you know, it's hard to say yes or no, you know, it looked like we would need 
some clinicians on staff and whatnot. It's hard to say without really diving in and, and looking at other states and seeing you know their system. One of the things that really stood out for us was um, the the cost to build a system. So right now um, we are in the middle of a modernization project for our UI tax and benefit system. By the time that that is done, it is our expectation that we will spend between eight and ten million dollars. That is um, being built by um, in a consortium. So the state of Idaho, the state of North Dakota, and the state of Vermont are in a consortium, and the federal government, you know, provides us with that money to build the system in hopes that um, one that will keep the cost at consortiums, arguably keep the cost down in building those things, but also it creates consistency across across the U.S. And then more people that have more consistent consistent systems, the better off they, they are in keeping costs down. So, um, so in having different conversations, we're trying to figure out is the expectation that we would piggyback this onto our current UI system? Is there like a standalone system? Like what what might we be asked to do? And if asked to piggyback that onto our current system, we have some real concerns because number one, we're not sure the federal government will even allow it. Um, number two, because it's being built right now, if we were to go in and ask them to build more to, to make capacity for this, it would significantly impact our go live, go live date, which is spring of 2019, um, but also I'm not sure the folks that are building it in the consortium have the capacity or the time or whatnot to add to the project. Um, and it would impact the third state too, right? Because there's like quite a timeline going on. So what are the three states again? Um, Idaho, North Dakota, and Vermont. Um, so I'm kind of like jumping around here a little bit. The other so if, I, if we looked at the state of Rhode Island, for example, they piggybacked it onto a disability system that they already had in place, something Vermont doesn't have, right? So um, if you look at the state of Washington, they built a standalone system, and while they're, pro you know, they're anticipating having more, um, more activity, so to speak, um, they estimated their IT cost to be 72 to $79 million. So even if ours is an eighth of the size, it's still going to be significantly more than what's in the estimate right now, which is which actually, state was that now? Uh, Washington. Washington. And that's just that's just for this new family. Yeah, that. they're creating a system, and it's completely separate from their UI system. Um, it's a, a standalone system, and um, there's just there's like a lot of like I said, a lot of different things that are mine where we're struggling to figure out how this works because. Again, if it's somehow tied to the information that we, the data that we collect for UI, it's not apples to apples. For example, um, let me give you a, okay. So the new program as we understand, the department can make rules and confirm eligibility based on employment of 12 out of 13 months. We don't collect that information. We collect quarterly information and employers report on a taxable wage base. So there's, I mean, that's just like one little piece, but there's differences in the information that we gather that would, you know, we would have to figure that stuff out. Um, let's see, we, um, UI, uh, let's see, oh, so in Vermont, we have around 26,000 employers, and there's just over 22,000 that actually pay into the UI tax. So there again, I think that um, it's going to be a different subset of employers who are are paying in on the you know the tax. So it's just some things that that would have to be resolved. There's some technical differences. Um, you know, th that was why I asked if Dirk might join us because he's been you know, working in it a long time and has some more detail. If you do want detail about the differences, we can get into that more. Um, do you want to jump in or? Well, I guess I'm, one of the things that I was thinking about is to make this as simple as possible, administratively, this went forward. Um, and this may bring a, may change the projection because it may bring a few more people on. But why don't I just say, if you're eligible for unemployment, if you would be eligible for unemployment benefits, you'd be eligible for this. 
so there wouldn't be any new runs being done. It would be the exact same criteria. And, you know, unemployment benefits, as you well know, in terms of eligibility, is, is trying to demonstrate some connection to the workforce. Mm -hmm. So that's what the eligibility criteria here yeah. is, whether you pick 12 or 13 months, 6. The goal is to show some connection to the right. workforce before yeah. you draw down the benefits. So instead of reinventing the wheel, why don't we just use what we have? Okay. That's one thing. But you mentioned something there that you said some employers may have to send some stuff in here, but wouldn't have to send something in for UI purposes. Correct. Who, who would they be? Um, so may I invite Dirk in on this one? Yeah, yeah just yeah, okay. turn with Dirk. Anderson uh, with the Department of Labor. Um, all reporting done now in the unemployment insurance system is done quarterly. Right. And um, those quarterly numbers are not broken down by a month. No, that's so not, if we well, have... I'm saying we're going to use the same system. Okay. Are there different right. employers out there that don't have to report now? If we use the same criteria, the same employers would have to report, but we currently have a subset of employers that do not pay taxes. They, they file quarterlies, but they're so-called reimbursable employers. Right. State, uh, state entities, municipal entities, school districts that um, do not pay a tax. So they, they just reimburse the system on a dollar for dollar basis when benefits right, are right, paid out. Right. So we, that's an anomaly that we'd have to address. Okay. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. I also, I wonder, I mean, again, I haven't thought this through, but I wonder if some of the very people that this bill is aiming to help might fall off though if the UI guidelines are used. I'm just thinking. Um, well, I, I, if that, I mean, we can explore yeah, that further, right. but, but in theory, um, you know, the, I, I would think probably more people would be helped because you don't have any requirement like 12 out of 13 months to determine workforce connection. You know, you could, you, could, you could get on the program with six out of 12 months or even less because it's a financial thing over quarters. So I think it's just a matter, if it's good enough for unemployment benefits, then why wouldn't it, in terms of workforce connection, why wouldn't it be good enough for, for this? That's a simple way of looking at it. But you're right, you can get granular right. and you may miss some people. But we're missing some people in what the House did which is of concern of mine if we go forward with this is that the granite workers are a perfect example. You know, they're seasonal workers. They, you know, they work year round, but maybe ten months. This is in your neck of the woods, you know. Uh, and you know, why should they be out because they don't work twelve out of thirteen months? And paying anyway. They're paying anyway. And they are caught at you. I mean, they're they're all included. They're all included. they're all included. So it, actually, that would be a, a much simpler way of doing it. Um, yeah, and I would say that, you know, if, in thinking about that, if, if somebody's time on unemployment benefits, so as you mentioned, like if a granite worker is collecting during that 10 weeks, um, if they're going to be part of this bill, I just would, would encourage you to consider, do we then tax their income, do we, do we apply the tax for the, the paid family leave on their unemployment benefit? Just something to think about, right? Because yeah, if we're going to utilize it. I don't know how the house dealt with that. But yeah, I don't know. So. But I think they did do something about, the, at least on the benefit side, right? You can't get unemployment and yeah, you can't double dip on unemployment you can't and pay a family leave. But, but there wasn't uh, any. There wasn't any. I don't think there was any tax. Tax is just on wages. wages. Just on wages. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so yeah, we have to think about that. Um, but I'm, I'm struggling. I tend to, you know, in some cases I make things more complicated. But in this area, I think. I look at how, what's the ballpark figure that's thrown out there right now as the number of people who will take this leave next year. That's six thousand. Six thousand. Out of how many people? Current, I mean, three hundred and twenty-five thousand employees currently. Three hundred twenty-five thousand are in the labor force, so, so, roughly. So I know right. I'm simplifying things, but it just strikes me that if if you're processing 6,000 checks and calculating the benefits through a computer and you get over the reimbursables aside, you get over the threshold of who's eligible, you know, 
some third party could do this other than you. But they send it to you, and you just say, yeah, this person's eligible. It would be eligible for UI. That's all they need to know to write to, to write the check and to, they have to calculate the check. It seems like six thousand checks doesn't doesn't strike me as pretty long. millions of dollars in in certainly annual costs. You know, maybe up front it might cost the hardware, but it just doesn't seem like that big of a program. I, I, I well, you know I agree that your program may be expensive in terms of determining UI, but you're doing that already. So you know, you started off by saying, you know, "Are we piggybacking or not?" And I think we should piggyback on steroids here. Yeah. So let me just just state though, those federally paid employees would have to have a an ability to charge to a state fund, and if too much is charged to the general fund, then the federal government is going to get pretty grumpy. So again, you kind of have to picture you've got like a whole separate group of employees that are working specifically on this. Um, program. So just keep that in mind when you talk about, you know, right now our, our UI, um, our UI, we have enforcement, we have an ability to appeal, we have, you know, so just consider there's a lot of things that are not addressed in the bill that are, are probably important components to running a program like this. So I'm not necessarily disagreeing with the cost estimate of, of the people, the, the people that are, you know, would need to be employed. Um, I don't have anything to compare it to, to be honest with you. So that's why I'm, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just, these are things, my job is to say, we have to think about all these things so we don't you know, break something that, or you know, make the feds pull our federal dollars away because we've crossed the line. Okay, so let me ask you, would there be any, uh, again, simplifying things? But let's say we, I don't think we'll ever wind up there because it makes sense to have you administer it and I want to ask you about the health assessment in a second. But let's assume we found, found a third party to administer it. All you were being asked to do was to, someone sent you an inquiry saying, is this person, if he applied for unemployment right now, would he be eligible? Is that something that we're afoul of the federal law to tell us? Give us that information, share that information? Ah, uh, boy, Dirk, do you have a thought on that one? As long as confidentiality was assured um, in the transfer, um, you know, the third party administrator would be bound by the federal regs um, keeping sort of, uh, unemployment insurance information confidential. But if we had that type of agreement, we could, we could transfer eligibility information do you, First do you, time I've thought about this, you, but I think do you we transfer do eligibility information to any other agency in state government right now? We share information with um, various agency, various departments of AHS primarily um, to do wage and benefit cross match to determine if they're eligible for federal programs such as food stamps, um, Medicaid, um, subsidized housing. So yes, we do that internally in the state um, with other state agencies. We don't share a whole lot of information with with third parties if who a, are not a, state agencies. If a, a, a claimant would have to file a claim for UI for you to tell them why they're eligible, they couldn't just make an inquiry and say, am I eligible for would I be eligible for UI if I got laid off right now? Currently, we do not determine monetary eligibility until an initial claim is filed. We would have the information to do that um, if, if we were told to do that, we could. It's not currently something that we do. Also, oh, isn't the 6,000 take up number estimated on the current language? And that if we expanded it to uh, include UI eligibility, then the take up rate could go up dramatically? If we included personal medical, it would. I mean, I anything. Know, you, know, I, I I don't, uh, you know, of all the factors here, yeah. the size of the program, I don't think the connection to the workforce is a huge. Well, it adds all the seasonal workers. And we have a fair amount of them in the state of Vermont. I guess I don't know how much how much detail they did when they did the 12 to 13 months and whether they can 
get that granular to tell us what the impact would be. But I think the benefit levels of the weeks are much more uh, bigger variables. Um, uh, so, um, but we'd have to look at that. Yeah. And we will. Uh, we'll, we'll try and get and the whatever we that. might add, how that would impact it. Joyce, would you uh, want to join the commissioner up at the No, you can stay there. We'll get another chair for you. Uh, sure. I did, actually, Dave. Uh, I'll chair. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm just thinking it's a good point to hear, to hear what the, the House did and how they calculated the administrative costs here. Thank you. Um, do you think Joyce on her own? Sir, oh, no, here, you want to scooch over. I would take Joyce on her own. Here, you can get that. I thought about it. It's not causing any of that. Yeah, it's not causing any of that. Sorry about costs and so forth. She probably already knows more about this. Uh, yeah. Well, why don't we just start with the last question, Senator Susi. Uh, do you, if we put this on the table of just turning this to UI, eligibility to be eligible for this program. I think it does do something in terms of administrative simplicity, uh, but does it bring in a, a huge number of new people? Do you have any idea? Right, so for the record, I'm Joyce Manchester with the Joint Fiscal Office. So let me explain that I did not do the modeling behind this um, paid family leave program. Um, as you know, the Institute for Women's Policy Research produced the, the big feasibility study for the Vermont Commission on Women back in the fall of 2016. And we have been relying on um, modeling since then as the, the provisions have evolved. Um, unfortunately, I, I talked to the modeler uh, earlier this week, and he did not save all of the files that went with the modeling, so he cannot tell me the number of people who were eligible um, a year ago when he most recently uh, ran the model for us. So, uh, you know, even if I knew the number of people who are eligible for unemployment insurance, um, I don't have a number to compare it to. Uh, you know, if this were really important, we could, you could perhaps find some money <laughs> to ask him to rerun the models from, from last year to get that number. Um, or there may be a different way to, to estimate 12 out of 13 months eligibility, I don't know. For, versus six or versus Versus whatever. the unemployment insurance. Well, how did get from the initial model, which wasn't 12 out of 13 months, right? It was six out of 12 or something? Right, so I'm well, less familiar with the original model because I wasn't involved at that point. But um, um, last, a year ago, uh, the legislature found some money so that he was able to model the bill, H-196, on the 12, 12 out of 13 months, right? So, very roughly, it seems to me like for the- There should be more people eligible under UI rules than under 12 out of oh, yeah. 13 months. But, I, but it's also true, uh, somewhat coincidentally, that I think the UI, uh, six months might be the logical number of the last 12 months to be eligible for the UI. I mean, there's a lot of variables. I understand the UI system in a lot of different ways, but if I had to pick a number, a calendar number, I might say six months. It's about, if you've worked for the last six months in the last year, you're probably be eligible for UI. So if we could look, if we could get back to the we just don't have the six month number from the original bill, they follow that? We don't have an aggregate number of people eligible. We know the number of people who would take leave under, the six, under this program. Under no, the six, no, under six months, no. no. We have a guest in it. Well, we no, had we had a, guest a we good had a, guest We had it at one point. So, yes, was did. it six out of 12 months? That was the original Was that proposal. the original eligibility when the feasibility yeah. study was yes. done? Okay. So, no. I thought once that the began. Just to clarify, so there. head shaking in the back. Can so to clarify here, the the ways and means proposal from the house, which is the twelve out of thirteen months, was modeled. The feasibility study modeled at nine thousand seventy nine dollars in wages in the past twelve months, which is equivalent to twenty hours a week. 
at minimum wage at the time, which was 963, I think, uh, over the course of a year. So it would have been six months at full time at the minimum wage, um, or a year at half time at the minimum wage. Uh, and so it, it used a $9,079 of income in the last 12 months eligibility level. So that's a greater income than, for example, is required under UI, which requires is it 2,000 something in a quarter and then an additional 40% of the highest quarter. In the other three quarters. There we go. So it's very simple. Uh, calculation for you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Um, that. Yeah, yeah, that so, cleared things up. That's really great. Yeah, but so that that's a little bit higher level than UI, and I don't know if we have actual. But it was originally, basically six months at minimum right. wage. So, so we're yeah. we're getting a little off field because I mean I think what we're talking about now is um, whether it would increase the program cost. And what the contribution might have to, if we do this, the contribution rate might have to be adjusted to. I'd like to continue to focus right now on the the administrative cost element and how we get that. What have what do you know about? What can you tell us about it? And we've heard a little bit from the commissioner. She said she's looked at some other states. What can you tell us about the administrative? Sure, so I think all of us have learned a lot in the past week <laughs> about administrative costs. So let me back up and explain that when, when I did the fiscal note a year ago, um, I was relying heavily on the feasibility study. And the feasibility study looked at the three states that had existing paid family leave programs in operation. So all of those three states built their systems on top of their temporary disability insurance systems. So that's where the 2.5 million IT initial startup cost came from. Um, now, we knew a year ago that uh, Vermont did not have a temporary disability insurance program to build on, but we naively thought that uh, we could instead build on the unemployment insurance system. Um, at the time, I believe the Department of Labor was fully engrossed in their overhaul of the IT system for unemployment insurance, it was difficult to get information. Nobody was willing to give us an estimate and so forth. So we went with the 2.5 million. The really interesting development since last April is that Washington State in June, I believe, June of last year, uh, voted out their bill to actually fund a paid family leave program. And as part of that, they produced a fiscal note, which is amazing as a fiscal note relative to our fiscal notes. <laughs> Uh, very, very thorough. And in that fiscal note, they talk about this, this estimate of 72 to $79 million. Now that is the cost over six years, and it covers personnel staffing to run the program, set up the program, as well as to develop the IT, the IT system. And what we don't know is what's the portion of that large number that is just developing the IT system because it so does cover. That, so you take the 72 million divided by six? Well, no, the problem is that you need the big upfront investment to develop the IT system. 72 includes, it includes the big upfront. Right. Okay. Right. And six so years. Have and you, six have years of you, maintaining. Have you, right. Have you, and running the program. Have you called them to get that right So I haven't called them. I, I believe I have a number so that I can call them. This is all happening very recently. So, yes. So they're a bigger state, and, and uh, if we assume um, just a, no basis to the assumption, but just to articulate it, uh, if we assume like $10 million up front for hardware, then the $72 million might be 62 divided by 6, $10 million in, the, in their state. Uh, there's no basis for those numbers, but I'm just trying to give an example. So we need to find that out and sort of see work back. And that would be a standalone system. Yes, right. I should add that I have been consulting with the JFO's IT consultant, a man named Dan Smith, who has done a lot of work for the state of Vermont in thinking about setting up uh, different IT systems for different programs. He says that there are unlikely to be big cost savings because we have only 8% of the population of Washington State. He thinks that the big costs are in just setting up the program to handle all the possible eligibility rules, all the 
you know, why are you taking medical leave for your uh, child who has this and this uh, disease and so forth. And also in making the connections to all those employers, some of whom are not currently part of uh, DOL uh, right. tax system. Right. So he thinks that, uh, I, I was trying to be optimistic in saying, oh, well, we only have 8% of the population, so does that mean you know, we shrink right. Right. the 75 million by something? Right. I can understand um, that. Well, he said probably not. Probably not big savings there. I, I was surprised at that. It's also true that the Washington state system includes uh, uh, sick leave. It's medical leave as well as family leave. And so I was thinking, oh, well, you know, that's a very complicated system. But in fact, you have to think about the very same problems if you're thinking about eligibility for people taking family leave to take care of a sick one. Or, you know, do they have a disease that really warrants a person? So how much, how much are we expecting the program at the house best version to pay out in benefits <coughs> in the first year? Ah, so based on last year's modeling, uh, do I know this? Yes, I 6,000 people may take it up, and an average of 2,500 a person, is that right? That's about 30, 15 million. So, so my numbers say about 6,121 people, um, uh, let's see, on average, each of them takes 4.2 weeks. The average weekly benefit was $651. And the total benefit cost was about $16 million. So that was a year ago. And we were assuming administ ongoing administrative costs of about 7.5% of the benefits. So that would add another $1.2 million under last year's modeling. So we get to a total cost of about $17 million. <laughs> so that's, uh, that doesn't include the upfront one time. <coughs> Well, last year it did because last year it was two and a half million for the upfront cost, okay. and we were collecting taxes prior to starting paying out benefits. So the year's worth, and we had assumed, perhaps incorrectly, that we could spread out the two and a half million over two years. So we were able to take in enough in the first year to start paying down those IT costs and then pay them off and then have a little bit of a reserve going forward as the system was in operation. So the assumption here is that whether the one-time, ongoing, or benefit costs, everything's going to be paid through this contribution rate. That was an assumption, right. yes. Okay, so, so I mean, we need, we need, we, how quickly do you think we can get some idea on your best guess on the administrative costs and assuming we I don't know if it helps you at all that we will use a system that that shares information from the department. And it, it may still be freestanding, but they don't have to go through a whole new eligibility calculation. Uh, no, so, that's just huge. Uh, you know, and where I'm going with this is I we need to know whether uh, it meets the straight face test. I mean, we're going to spend you know as much on administrative costs as we are on benefits. And my solution is to raise it up. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, we need to know that. So, but also, I just, I just have a question to ask: How did, how was this lab to get out of the house with more costs than contributions? I mean, because Last year, the contributions, as far as I can tell, will only if if, if all three hundred twenty-five thousand workers are paying in at only thirty-eight dollars a year. That's oh, you know, that's, that's just it's a on average. That's, a that's on average for uh, on no, minimum. Well, I don't know if that's a low. I don't know if that's average or not. No, no, no. So what are we? Can, what are we thinking? The total contributions will be in the first year. So I, or a year. unfortunately, I don't have total contributions here, but I I do know that what we did was to look at total Social Security number earnings um, right. at one hundred fifty thousand or less. So, right. so last year the bill said cap cap contributions at one hundred fifty thousand. Right. So. Uh, Mayor Erowitz and the Department of Labor nicely gave me a distribution of wages. Of I was able to look at total wages below 150000 The total costs were divided into those uh, total wages, and the, the rate came out actually, well, so we decided to go with 0.141%, which would provide a little cushion, a little reserve, right. in addition to the benefits. So that raised at like 18 costs. or 20? So I don't remember exactly off the top of my head. The numbers definitely worked, and I have a, a spreadsheet that showed the reserves going forward for a few years and so forth. So it all worked last year. But 
that was with 2.5 million in the IT startup costs. And if it's now 30, 50, so we don't 70 know. million, we really well, don't know. Well, we need to figure out, obviously, how to make right. it work. Right, and the question is how long does it take to figure that out? Um, it is true that I will talk to um, Craig Bolio, who's at the Department of Taxes this afternoon, to find out if, if they have a different program that we might link into. Uh, so that would be run through the Department of Taxes rather than through the Department of Labor. I don't know if, if, if that would work, um, but that's a possibility. Uh, the Dan Smith, the JFO IT guy, um, cautioned me not to come up with a number and not to offer, you know, to come up with a number in, in any <laughs> short time period because it's so complicated. It really depends on the details of, of the program and uh, you know how the state is going to manage the program. Who's going to do it? How how does it work? So uh, well, what is the experience we had? Didn't we add on the the healthcare assessment to the UI program uh, at the Department of Labor? I know you've got. Have you gotten rid of it since? Yeah, we have. We have. Um, may I invite yes. Dirk again? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, so the healthcare assessment uh, was given to the when it was so called. Um, Kavanaugh and Health back in 2007, I think, given to the department to administer. Um, so that was an additional tax that we were collecting, and it was going directly into um, the health care fund. It has to be after Obama was elected, and that was 08. Yeah. Well, Kavanaugh was, wasn't Kavanaugh? Was Kavanaugh? Around there. I don't, I don't remember the exact. Exactly, but 2008, and, um, we were able to accomplish that by um, using our existing UI staff. Um, we worked with the feds to say, you know, we're going to come up with an administrative cost for this program that's going to come out of the general fund, or I believe it came out of the general fund, um, or it may have come out of the collection of the tax itself. I'm not sure, but. Basically, we said we're going to use some of our federal, federally funded people to administer this program, but they're going to charge their time to a state fund, and so we were able to do that and still be okay with the <coughs> Department of Labor, um, and we were able to tack that tax onto our existing quarterly filing form and try to um, minimize um, the burden to employers and. Um, and we did that up until um, December. Last December, we transferred the program to the Department of Taxes because it was not a feature we could build into this um, new modern system that we're developing with our consortium of, of Idaho and North Dakota because neither of those states had a similar program. Um, so the, the cost and the burden of building that into this system that we we're developing was not something that the feds were going to support. So tax. So you have some track history of how much over the years you were charging for this function. We should. Okay. Yes. Could you get that to us? Okay. And um, what is tax? Do you have any idea how tax is going to do it? How how they're going to get this information or how they're going to build with employers for this? Well, they're doing it now. Um, well, okay. Yeah. And apparently, but they're not, you, they're not on your four quarterly forms anymore? No. Oh. Okay. So we should. And, you know, he, we can get you that. That Just keep in mind, we were not determining eligibility, doing um, uh, enforcement. You know what I mean? I mean, there was enforcement, obviously, for people to pay, but it was di a different kind of program. So I just want people to keep that in mind in terms of the level of commitment from the staff that was working that part. Of. But that, yeah, that's it's, fine. That, I'm just that program had it all, its own complex. <laughs> oh yes, it did. <laughs> uh, so I mean, it's just yep. a, a ballpark to see okay. how, if it can be done and how you know, how expensive it is. And I, I'm a little concerned, Joyce, with the advice that you're getting because I mean, you could put all the caveats you want in your report, but we need something. Yeah. You know, and that's Bad. that's Joint Fiscal's job to. Let us know if we want to move forward with this idea. We can't just be told, you know, this could go to a hundred billion dollars. Right. So, uh, right. I think Washington sounds like 
know, even if we just have to borrow from what they're doing there, it's going to be, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel, I don't think. I mean, it's not going to be exact one way or another. And that, in the bill, there is this, there is an understanding that, you know, this is the first shot across the bow. It could go down, it could go up, you know. But that's true of any program, I think, you know. Right, so one thought I had was that we buy the Washington State system from them. Um, so they are just developing that program now. Their program won't begin to offer benefits until January 2020, I believe. Um, so there's nothing to buy yet. But um, it's also interesting that they built in much more time to develop the system before they started the, the rollout of the benefits. So they had two and a half years in between the time the bill passed and, uh, and they first plan to pay out benefits, and of course that hasn't happened yet, so we haven't seen if they stick to their timeline. But um, I think we may have been a little optimistic last year in thinking that there'd be one year for, for collecting taxes and building the system, and then benefits would start the very next year. That may not be feasible. And the problem with the bill being delayed. Right. Uh, though we did change the dates, didn't we, in, in this regard? We, or we will change the dates. We yeah, we'll just be bumping them out uh, a year this now, but then those dates could also be changed to build in a, a longer development period for a, an IT system or whatever is necessary. The bill had passed last year. The dates in last year's the dates in last year's bill were optimistic, significantly, significantly less than what Washington provides. Okay, so uh, I guess I do have a question. Uh, the governor talks about he supports a voluntary program. Have you given any thought what that might look like? I have not spoken with the, the governor about that. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know if the state of New York is voluntary, but I do know that they um, their program is more like a like a disability, short-term disability program where employers collect a tax from their employees and they, they use that money to buy insurance, um, this type of insurance. I don't know, I honestly have, haven't really thought too much about that. I just, you know, I know my job is to think about how we might administer the program and we've been thinking about that again, just, you know, I know it's been challenging and Joyce has been really patient with us just because we don't have a lot of, I'm a number cruncher, I love doing this stuff, but we just don't have the capacity to do the research. Um, and so it's, it's challenging and we're trying, I mean, we, we tried to reach out to Washington as well, but um, I don't know, I don't know what that voluntary program would look like either. I just, I'm not sure, you know, if enough people would pay in to, to cover the benefits of it. I don't know. Sure. So I did want to mention that there are three states that offer employers the choice of um, working with their disability insurance companies to offer uh, paid family leave. So New Jersey, California, and New York. New York, thank you, New York. Um, and New York's system was just put into effect this January. So again, it's, it's a brand new program that was just set up. Uh, the bill says that, that um, paid family leave benefits can be obtained either through the state fund or through the employer's disability <coughs> insurance company or through self-insurance, meaning that the employer funds the program himself, herself. Um, but in fact, the bill doesn't have, or I couldn't find any notice in the bill of setting up that state program. So, so it says that there can be a state program, but I'm not sure that sure. it's set up. I can speak to that. Um, for the record, Damian Leonard, Legislative Council. Um, the New York program is built off of the existing temporary disability insurance program. So the state fund was set up uh, like 50, 60 years ago at this point when that program came into effect in the, I think it was the early 50s maybe. Um, but it, that's beside the point. They've had that fund set up for a long time. Um, as part of their temporary disability insurance and their workers' comp program. So New York's system is unique in that it's run through their workers' comp law. And then, so the, the insurance, um, your workers' comp insurer uh, will provide you with a 
basically a rider on your workers' comp policy that provides the TDI insurance and now will provide paid family leave insurance. Um, and so it's part of that. And the deductions, there is a maximum contribution from employees and then employers pay the balance. It's mandatory, it's not voluntary. Is that, yeah, it's, it's mandatory. So they're, they're, it's, the insurance is mandatory. Where the employer gets it from is up to them. They can go through the state insurance uh, program, they can self-insure, or they can purchase it from a private insurance company. But it's universal. But it, it is uh, more or less universal, yeah. Um, and I can't remember all the specific um, caveats in their law about eligibility and so forth, but they, it's basically you, you have to either provide it or purchase it from the state. The New Jersey and California models are a little different in that there's the large state fund, but then employers are allowed to purchase private insurance that provides at least the level of benefits in the state program. Uh, it could provide slightly different and more benefits, but it has to provide at least the same level of benefits. And I believe in both of those, there's a caveat that it can't cost the employees anymore. Um, it could cost them less if they're able to get it for less so, privately. I, I, I'm guessing that one of the challenges of anything voluntary is you get only a partial pickup rate. And as a result of not having everybody contribute in, the people that do buy it have to pay a lot more. Is there any examples or numbers out there of any state in the country that has a sort of a voluntary structure out there and can we see how much that's costing versus the, 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 the universal kind of system? I'm not aware of any voluntary state paid family leave or uh, disability programs. Um, I think your best model would be looking at, um, you know, uh, sort of private disability insurance pools, whether they're run through an employer or a union. Um, and but that's that's way outside of my area of expertise. All of the state programs that currently exist have a mandatory, whether it's you get it like in New York where you you are just mandated to provide the insurance and then you choose where you provide it from, or the other states where it's a mandatory uh, state program unless in the case of New Jersey and California you opt out. And I should note. There's a summary of the New Jersey, California, and New York uh, laws that I sent to the committee yesterday, which I think will be posted on the website. Um, and it's just a, a page and a half summary of the I three programs. So it's, that uh, it's kind of a 20,000 foot view Is that this? of them. Thank you. Uh, that's the tax treatment. The yeah. other piece there on the back is the summary. Yeah, yep. private insurance options. Yep. Yeah. So that's. That's there for everyone, and that, that should be up on the website for the other folks in the room. Um, but it, yeah, I'm not aware of a voluntary program, and I think the main question with those would be how do you ensure that uh, it's actually affordable? Right. Um, how do you because you don't get have the broader, the broader pay-in, um, right. and, and you'd really need to talk to an insurance expert who has expertise in you know, sort of the voluntary insurance market where you might buy a, a personal disability policy or something like that. And I, I just have no idea. And can you, can you just, off the top of your head, I know we have this, can you tell us the um, contri contribution arrangements in the states that have this between employer and employee right now? Uh, off the top of my head, I, I can't remember the breakdown. It is on the, the uh, handout from the National, yeah. uh, is that National Partnership, Partnership for, women for Women and Children, and children. Yeah. Women and Families? Yeah, they, they have a breakdown of, of that. And Joyce's chart, too, with the seven states also has a breakdown of, of uh, whether it's employee, employer, or just employee funded. And I think that's the, the way the states break out. The uh, I believe Washington State did both employer and employee, right? 
Yes, I think so. Yeah, to take so a that look would at the mean chart. I'm looking at three states that have both employer and employee benefits, and two states that have employee only. I, I'm sorry, not benefit contributions. So three states, employer and employee contributions. Um, Are they all 50-50? No. Which sheet are you on, Joyce? I'm kind of well, lost on I, sheets I here. I have updated this sheet, and I believe they need this to one that has some um, that says comparison of paid family leave in yes. seven states. Yes. And what's the date at the top? It's of the March page? 17. Oh, that's X 17. I have 14. <laughs> March 14, 2017. Okay. I believe it should say March 14, 2018. Okay. Let's see if we have that. <laughs> I okay, should update it in March. Um, and I'm not finding my copy. There is an old version of that table that I'm looking at from last year's fiscal note, which is close, except that Washington State wasn't. Well, let's see what we have. So we're, the last uh, best version is half. So one, we're, we're at one, zero, point one, four. The next one is at 0 0.255, then 0.5, then 1.2, 0.9, and then 0.28. So we're half the cost of any other state at this point. Uh, that's in large part because we uh, don't offer medical leave. Right. So the newest one we have is from the National Partnership, oh, and that's February 18th. I mean, at least that's what I have in mind. <coughs> so I think Damien did send around the March, March 14th version, which includes Washington State. As well. Yeah, the, the year was just not updated. Right. It just said Washington State. So is that the one sheet? It's this one right here. This is the one you should look at. Okay, so it is this one. Okay, great. Does anybody else have any questions at this point? This chart's very helpful for all the variables. Yes, lots. So. All right, so uh, no other questions. We'll take a, a break. <laughs> Senator Bruce is jumping out of his chair. <laughs> He's so excited. We'll, we'll come back really alone, but before you, before yeah. you guys go, uh, well, work together as best you can, but we need some, you know what we need as best you can. And, and we need to whatever caveats you need, <laughs> and I would like something back by, what's today, Wednesday? <laughs> by Tuesday. next Tuesday? Thank you. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say, you know, in addition to numbers, I think part of the struggle is if you look at the Washington um, statute or the, the intention, the PFL section, it's like, you know, very robust, like 50 to 60 sections. And our bill is six sections, which I'm all about simplicity. I just, I think part of what the struggle is, is the lack of clarity of what we're trying to estimate. So for what it's worth, I'm just, I, I know that's not the answer you want, but... It just makes it really hard because the bill just doesn't give us enough meat. So, so uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. We need to clar <laughs> clarify. We need enough meat. We need to give me some of that because I'm not sure what you're what exactly it's just, you're looking for. I mean, what does the system have to be able to handle in terms of like determining eligibility? There's just a whole bunch of components that are not addressed currently. Well, I think we would like to assume that in terms of eligibility. We'd like to use We're going to use UI. UI. Okay. Well, we've got a couple of examples, and you say you share. Yes. I know you share. You know whether people are getting benefits or not. I don't know whether you share potential eligibility, but certainly finding out whether someone could be eligible for unemployment, you can look with the data you have and plug it. If you wanted to know at your office, John Doe may be taking off. Uh, will he be eligible? You could do, do a run and find out. So, at the very least, we'd like to just use. I think it makes sense. I haven't heard anything to the contrary that why it wouldn't make sense. It may bring more people on, but there's certain people that I think is really unfair that we're leaving off a seasonal 
workers. So uh, I don't think it's going to be a big jump. And you know, there are other things we could adjust, and we haven't decided what we want to land on as a contribution rate. So, oh, 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 oh. but beyond the eligibility, Time. Yep. what are the other things that you think are in these six sections that are? Yeah, why don't, yeah, we, we, we'll regroup and let, we will give you a list of our concerns in writing. Or the programmatic. Um, yeah, the, the programmatic things that we're just Questions. struggling with on how this will work. And, and they may be really simple. You may say like, oh, Don, that's, you know what I mean? I think we just need to kind of regroup, write something down, we'll get it to you right away. And we're and, so, so we're talking the same language here. Yeah. We're talking about how that detail impacts administration. Correct. Yes. Program. And, program. Right. And whether Washington is any more complicated or less complicated than ours. I mean, I don't think there's anything in the House bill that's not defined at this point. That's what I'm concerned with. I mean, it's, it's all there. I mean, there are like six variables. Yeah. And, you know, we've said what they are, you yeah. know. I will go back and look at it. I just, my initial reaction to it was I have, I, I, I walked away from reading it saying I have a lot of questions. Okay. So. We'll make a list, and like okay. I said, it may be nothing. I don't, you know, okay. I just, I just recognize what Joyce's task is too, and I'm trying to figure. That, I, I know you want numbers. I just, it's a struggle. So, well, but we'll work together. Well, well, this is part of what we're missing from the ha house in a way is a more fulsome understanding of the full cost to roll it out. And so I think it's really important that everyone that look at that feasibility study because the basis for the fiscal note is the feasibility study which lays out in great detail right. the number of people you need to do the various jobs and what the various jobs are and what the qualifications of those people might be and so forth. So there's a lot of background in that feasibility study that I obviously did not replicate in the fiscal note. Okay, but um, just to clarify, so, so we would be using the benefit amount from last year's house passed bill? Initially, it may not be enough. For now, let's just deal with the house. Yeah, deal with what we have. Okay, so the only thing we're changing is the eligibility and the um, IT costs, presumably. So we're going with six weeks, 80% for this. Yeah. Uh, just uh, for uh, initially. Uh, what, what, let me just be clear. Why would any of those things change affect the administrative costs? Um, <laughs> so, I'm going to give you a for instance. Sure. Okay. So um, for UI, for example, if you are collecting uh, uh, unemployment benefit, every week you have to reapply for your benefit and somebody is determining whether you're still eligible. Are these folks gonna have to come back every week and, and have a redetermination or no, or no, but then you know how are we going to know they haven't gone back? I, those things just are not spilled out, those are, they're real questions because it takes time. Every time you're determining eligibility, it takes a lot of, you know, people power to make those. Those are just, like I said, it sounds really insignificant, no, but it's you're, not. No, you're correct. In terms of initial eligibility, I think we can use your monetary termination. Right. I guess we have it, if you're right, I don't know if anybody's asked the question, you know, how often are these checks gonna be issued and does the person you have to submit a medical note or right. Uh, What's required? What do they, they have to do to yeah, check in exactly. to establish? Right. So the, those are the things I think that make me most anxious about right. sort of where we're at. And I have that's why I was saying let us write some of these things down because right. they may seem little, but they could have a profound impact on the cost of administering right. if we right. don't address them up front. Right. Well, so we should we should be asking in terms of phone calls or whatever, other states, you know, Absolutely. how do they, how do they yeah, do, how do, they do that? it? You those know, details, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Absolutely not. <laughs> it's it, it, it exists. Absolutely. And those details are all covered in the feasibility okay. study. Okay, I'll go back. Where they yeah. looked at the three states with the existing programs and they assumed that the Vermont program would be set up the same way. Okay. So you are eligible at the start, you're given a maximum of six weeks, mm -hmm. um, you choose how many weeks to take, mm -hmm. um, yeah. It just seems, yeah. it just, strikes me, the bottom line here is if this program, whether it's piggyback or independent, was prohibitively expensive from an administrative point of view, somebody would have screamed about that already. So, because we can always tinker with the contribution rate a little bit, you know, to, to cover the cost, what we can't do is have a program that's 50% administrative costs. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. 
Well, thank you for having Thank me. you for coming in. That's, and California's been doing this for so long. No, they're, no. They've been doing their temporary disability insurance program for a very long time, as have many other, well, three other states. I thought their paid family leave program nope. was the long and most established when it was in, in nope. 02. Nope, temporary disability insurance. In the feasibility study, there are 16 employees. So, Commissioner, can you get your list to Joyce by the end of this week? By the end of this week. Oh, yeah, I get a crappy. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, right, that's exactly what I used. Just got a yeah. chart. Yeah. That was the base, this chart. Have yeah. you got this? Yeah. Do you guys have this yeah. for the feasibility yeah. study? That's what I used. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm.